for the masses. Headline the big news, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. Listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Good evening, Fade to Black. Bespoke Radio for the Masses, uh, yeah, how you doing, how you doing, it's Monday, Monday, August 26, 2019, 237 days into the new year, just 128 days left, we are live from a bunker somewhere in the middle of beautiful downtown Burbank, California, and I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States. Hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black for KJCR, the Game Changer Network, and KGRA, the planet. I'm Harold Stevie Church. What is cracking, everybody? How you doing? How you doing? We had an amazing weekend. Yes, yes, Frankie, I got the... Hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil, I think is the last one, right? I got him, Frankie, amazing. I'll uh, I'll show him everybody to the camera, okay? All right, I'll take care of that here in just a minute. Welcome, everybody. What an amazing week we have got coming up here on Fade to Black. That's right. We're calling it Amazing Women Week. Yeah. We should do an Amazing Women Month. That's what we should do. We should just do the whole month. That's what we should do. Yeah, yeah. Thinking about it. Thinking about it. Tonight, very special guest, Geraldine Orozco, is here. Geraldine is an intuitive DNA reprogrammer and Ascension coach. 2013, Geraldine experienced a vivid abduction from a possible extraterrestrial being or beans through her bedroom window. We're going to be talking about all of that tonight. She was taken aboard a ship and was introduced to her eight hybrid children. The next morning, she encounters a hypersensitivity to the human electromagnetic field. This discovery initiates a journey for her to find the truth about what happened. She has appeared on many uh, radio programs and several conferences, and recently she's featured in the new film Extraordinary, the seating, which is set for worldwide release next week on September 3rd. And I would like to welcome for the first time to Fade to Black, Geraldine Orozco. Geraldine, good evening. How are you? Hi, Jimmy. Thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor to be here. Oh, the honor is all ours, Geraldine. Trust me on that. But before we get started, you get the first time guest disclaimer. All right. Are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> okay. It's just you and I sitting on my couch, Geraldine, have a com- having a conversation. Having a conversation as friends. And where that conversation starts, it starts. Where it ends, it ends. But we're going to end as friends. There you go. You ready to go? I am ready. Now, we have met a few times um, in the past. But this weekend, uh, we, we had a chance to uh, hang out with you uh, at Steve Neal's art show out there in Ventura. Very cool. And and speaking with you, um, I asked you a, a couple of direct questions, which, which I'm going to ask again tonight, obviously, on the show. But but um, uh, looking at you and your demeanor, uh, your face, and the way that uh, you handle yourself, um, I was immediately 
forced into asking this question only because of your appearance and the way that you carry yourself. I was like, what did you do before this? Right, because you 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 carry yourself as a professional is what I'm getting at, right? And you 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 look like you could be in any career anywhere. And I wanted to know what it was that you did before that. If you don't mind, can we actually start there? Absolutely, and thank you for asking because I think it kind of plays a, a big role in understanding, you know, my story and this experience. I mean, really, it, yes. You know, Jimmy, um, before I got into any of this, I mean, I, I was an event planner. I had a high-end event planning company that I started literally out of my garage in my home here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And um, when I was, uh, when I was, uh, I was in telecom prior to that. And when I was getting, um, uh, basically my position was getting, uh, you know, outsourced to China, I saw the incredible opportunity in Chinese import export, and I decided to import a lot of beautiful uh, event planning supplies. And I started my business from one day to the next. And that's what I was doing for 10 years. And we became very successful, you know, it was a very hard road. But um, alongside of that, I mean, I've always been very interested in uh, meditation. So I also started Bay Area Meditation, which I taught um, out of my my office here in in, in Fremont, um, I held meditation groups and I was teaching corporate meditation to companies all over here in the Bay Area. Uh, companies like Facebook, Google, uh, you know, uh, Oracle. Um, we work with Square. You know, all all these companies here in the Bay Area that were that were teaching meditation to. So I was doing that for ten years prior to all of this, and in between my transition into working full time and what I do. Now, now. So um, kind of a completely different world, you know, all having to do with event planning, high end weddings, uh, baby's first birthday, you name it. You well, know, life, I, yeah. let, okay. And, and I find that interesting to the point where I don't want to get off of that. But and so we'll, we'll circle back. So let, let's pin that to the wall. But now let's back up before 10 years before you started your uh, event planning business. And, and growing up, had you any experiences? Were you an experience? Did anything? Did you have crazy parents? Did you have any idea what you were getting yourself into? Not at all, Jimmy. And that's one of the things. The reason why I bring up my past is that I had no understanding of even the existence of ET life. Okay, my interest was nowhere near that. Um, you know, I grew up in a spiritual family that I am blessed for my both my parents are, you know, well educated, and they're very spiritual, they're always reading, they're always you know, learning. And we grew up in a in a in a family where we were always asking questions, looking at different religions, you know, my parents always taking us to a Buddhist church or a Hindu Hindu ceremony, to kind of become really aware of the world around us and culture and religion and art. So we were really, you know, well raised in that sense, well educated, where we're always questioning and looking at cultures and, you know, learning the respect for those cultures. I mean, we lived in South America for a couple years during high school to complete my education. And, and it was a very, very intense education down there. When we came back to the U.S., um, you know, I graduated with high honors in high school. So, um, you know, my I had a very normal life, uh, you know, focused on personal development. I mean, that was always the invitation that my parents would allow us and uh, would invite us, you know, to have this personal development interest. But that's about it. I mean, not nowhere near talking about aliens or any of this stuff that I'm going to talk about tonight. I know, right? Now, <laughs> I, 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 are your parents listening to this show right now? I don't think they're listening right now, but I'm sure they will check in later. <laughs> are, are they aware? Are they aware of your public speaking and you, uh, you know, your, your, you being out of the closet? They are. They are. And I am very grateful for that because when I first had my experience, and I'll probably go into that in a little bit in 2013, they were the first people that I felt, uh, you know, comfortable telling what had happened to me. And of course, at the time, you know, 
of course, I have no no idea what I'm telling them, but I'm telling them my, my abduction experience and it was emotional and it was, you know, just I, I was blown away by it. And, you know, they're very supportive and loving. So they're like, oh, honey, that's so nice. Oh, how cute. That's wonderful. You know, just very supportive because my first experience was not anything that was traumatic per se. My, my first conscious experience, I should say conscious, meaning that I was fully aware of what was occurring to me being taken out of the room. Uh, you know, the whole experience that I'm going to share with you in a minute, you know, they, they thought of it as something that was like, oh, that's interesting. But they were questioning whether that was conscious or dream time. They didn't understand and neither did I at that time, right? So it was just an incredible experience that had happened to me. And what changed things for me was that that Monday, that following Monday, when I had my first meditation client, uh, um, I could see their entire multidimensional body. And I can see uh, energy in their body, I could see colors around their body. I mean, it was just, uh, you know, actually quite nauseating, because, you know, I, I had stayed home that weekend after that had happened. So I hadn't seen anyone until that Monday. Right. Right. And, uh, you know, when I was in front of my client teaching meditation, I could feel her emotions, I could feel what she was thinking, I was sensing everything. Um, that we were doing. And I and and it was shocking. It was shocking. I didn't I wasn't prepared for that. And I said, What happened? What happened to me? How did this happen? And it took me two months to kind of integrate that experience. I didn't want to leave my home. I didn't want to go anywhere. I couldn't go grocery shopping. I couldn't go to the mall. Uh, it was just overwhelming the sensitivity, the level of sensitivity that I had acquired from that experience. So that was my proof to myself of of that something very real and powerful had occurred to me that evening, you know, that night. Do you have brothers or sisters? Yeah, I have a younger brother. And how how was he with it? Does he introduce you to his friends like this is my sister Geraldine? She was abducted. <laughs> you know, my brother is very much a scientific mind. You know, he's very analytical about things. So it's been a hard journey. I mean, he's not really interested in the ET stuff. So it's hard for him to mm -hmm. kind of look at this and be like, okay, this is real, you know. Um, but I value his opinion because it kind of helps me understand what the analytical mind, what the person that really has no ability to comprehend these things needs in order to understand them. You know, I, I completely understand. Understand. And there are parts of my family also, people in my family that have a hard time accepting this, you know. Well, they don't they understand that, you know, everybody, including myself, my family, uh, I've got a couple of brothers that kind of get it, right? They kind of get it, but but I have parents and adopted parents and, and you know, just things and stuff. They don't, you know, they know what I do. They don't understand it. They don't, you know, they, they're just in another, they're just in another place, you know, and, and I can't force it and neither can anybody else, right? You can't force it. So, you know, maybe your brother one day, he's going to look up in the sky, see something whack and you're going to get that phone call. <laughs> you're get I'm that waiting phone for that phone call. Yeah. I need some advice, Geraldine, yeah. because something just happened and my watch was an hour later. You know, you're going to get that phone call. So yeah. now, okay, going back to when you started to uh, see see colors and 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 see people, mm -hmm. you don't have anybody giving you advice, right? You don't know what's going on at this point. Where you're you're confused. How far now that you know about what had happened? Uh, how far past the the window incident was this? Was it the next day? The next week? Yeah. Uh, well, as I said, this happened to me on a Friday. Right. And so Saturday, Sunday, I stayed home. I didn't really have anything to do outside my house. Monday, I saw my first client. So it was like three days later that I saw the first person that I spoke to <laughs> and interacted with after that experience. Well, this is the reason why I'm asking. Yeah. At, at that Monday, did you have... Uh, uh, any memory about Friday? Oh, yes, very much so. Because I, the very, because this is what happened. After my experience, I, I became conscious upside down on my bed. My bed was open. I was laying upside down on the end of the bed. That never happens, first of all. Um, second of all, I was uh, dizzy, you know, throughout it a little bit, kind of just out of it, out of sorts, out of sorts, and the body feels sore, 
you know, most of the time, you know, now I know because I, now I've experienced other experiences consciously and now I, I can kind of recognize how contact feels. The body will feel sore, you know, and um, that's what it felt like to me. And so I had to call my parents immediately and tell them. I had to tell them everything that had happened step by step. And it served a purpose because I also, the moment waking up, had a notebook which I wrote down the alien language or the language, the symbols that were shown to me on the craft. Um, and so, you know, this was a very vivid thing. So I, rem I clearly remember what occurred. I mean, it was six in the morning when I became conscious again upside down on my bed. You know, so um, and I can go into that story in a little bit, but yeah, yeah, and and we will. Um, and the next thing I want to set everything up for when we come back. Also, after the break, we have so many different things uh, that we need to try to get into this show. You'll be back, and we'll do an another show. But there's too much to discuss here. Um, I watched uh, your Alba uh, Weinman uh, regression stuff, and the um and she's really good right mm -hmm. um, yeah. yes she's really good that when you oh, okay it's it, i guess i'm going to ask it this way how much did you remember from her sessions immediately after this session did you remember anything at all it's like a yes or no question of her sessions mm -hmm. No, not oh, okay, much. Okay, okay, perfect. Yeah. So going back and reviewing the sessions, how much of that lined up step for step with your actual physical memory? After reviewing, yes. 100%. 100%. 100%. Because yeah. you said one, um, uh, uh, I, I want to get right back to the actual experience itself. But there's a reason why I'm 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 doing it this way. The you made a couple of comments at the beginning. I'm going to paraphrase here. Okay, I'm going to paraphrase. I didn't you know write this down word for word. But you said something about uh, you were in a place of uh, crystals, of uh, blue skies. You were seeing green. Can you take me to that moment because that wasn't probably part of your physical memory, was it? Right. I mean, when the regression, so the regression is kind of a process and the regression, I'm touching many different parts of my life, not just what the abduction. Right. 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 Um, and I have I have four regressions with Alba. So the, the one that we're probably talking about is the very first one. That's the right. One, three, three. Mm -hmm. uh, Alba Wyman, one, three, three. And this is the one where I am. Uh, asking questions about the concept of contact and how hybridization or hybridization children could happen. So the first part where I'm uh, being shown, because how Alba works is you make a list of questions that you have for her, and they can be things on your life, things that you're working on, questions that you have on yourself that you want to heal. And so what, so, some of those questions were personal things that I was addressing. Um, and the first question had to do with my connection with some with someone that was very close to me that passed away. And so the first part, when you're entering this regression, this is what we're addressing. We're asking, you know, what was your connection with this person? And that's where it took us to that waterfall with crystals. And my connection with that person was a past life with them where, um, you know, he had attacked my younger brother and I was terrified for my life and he was very aggressive. So these are the things that happen. I mean, when we're talking about regression, we're talking about accessing parts of consciousness, um, you know, that are, are creating experiences. These are experiences that we're, we're connecting to. And, um, you know, what regression is really is that we're looking at the, the, what we believe is a past or a future aspect of ourselves, which we're kind of living in simultaneously at this moment. So those are imprints memory imprints of past experiences that I have um, believed to have experienced with this person that we were uh, inquiring about. So that's maybe what you're talking about, that first part. But this regression goes into other parts um, where where I was brought in to a past life where I was with Jesus, and then that takes me to a connection that I had with um, some being that was called Nephilim. And from there, opens up this entire 
array of information uh, regarding uh, DNA lineages, original bloodlines that come into the earth and seed life on this planet. And I'm being shown a map of all of these different places in the movement of information and how these lineages are kind of developed and spread around the planet earth. So uh, what was interesting about this regression, Jimmy, is that you know, I before this, I had never heard the word Nephilim. Um, I didn't know what it was. I didn't know who they were, um, anything around them. So when, when the information came in through here and we're kind of reviewing all of this, later, you know, after the fact, doing my personal research to comprehend what I had just spoken about because I'm thinking I'm speaking crazy here, the links and the information that was provided was incredibly uh, accurate in terms of the timeline and some historical information that I was able to research and kind of document from that regression. So that was the thing that blew my mind, you know, blew my mind completely. And what was the, uh, the what was the date of the initial contact on that Friday? What, what year? I think it was October 2013 on an October. That was October 2013, and which uh, obviously that and and the things that followed eventually led you to Alba uh, for the regression therapy. When did the sessions, uh, the first session with Alba, happen? That was, I think, November of, two, oh, no, July of 2017 was my first regression with her. And then my second one was November, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Between, uh, this is for the audience. Now, between yeah. October of 2013 and November of 17, w- was there uh, continuous contact? There was no contact in between. There, okay, well, contact not conscious, like my first initial contact. So during that time, I had gotten into a relationship that was becoming very serious. And, you know, we were thinking about settling down, having children. And during those years, what had been happening to me is that I was becoming pregnant and having miscarriages. And I didn't understand why I was having the miscarriages and uh, at times, because I work so much, my re- my past relationship, I'm going to get a little intimate here. You know, we, we really didn't have uh, the ability to be intimate with each other many times. And sometimes I would become pregnant, even when we weren't together. Okay, so this is the thing. And so those things would happen. And at the time, I didn't I had no idea what the hybridization program was. Okay, let me so, let, let me ask the question that is on everybody's mind, right? Sure. When you say that, mm-hmm. obviously your uh, relationship uh, gets strained because somebody uh, in a normal situation, the normal question, somebody's fooling around. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's <laughs> it, you have that okay. because he's that's what he's going to say. Right. Right. Well, mm-hmm. well, you know, we we had a very trusting relationship from that perspective. Um, so the question was, you know, what, what's happening? And when I went to the doctor, the doctor said, oh, well, you're probably stressed and you probably want to have children so much that your hormones kind of, you know, create this false pregnancy. And, um, you know, and it, it was just very stressing time because on the other side of it, when I would get pregnant, we would be very happy and we'd be like, oh, this is wonderful. You know, let's make the best of it. And then, you know, two months into that, you know, we would have the miscarriage. Uh, you know, when we went to the doctor, their doctor would say, oh, you know, there's uh, there's nothing here. You know, you're not pregnant. It was a false alarm. And I got to tell you that during those years, I mean, these are things that I kept very privately to myself and with him. You know, we would share this information and it would be very stressing, very depressing, very uh very hard for me emotionally. But again, I never linked the hybridization program to that because I didn't understand how the hybridization program worked. And this is why I talk about this. And I'm very, um, you know, open about my experiences, because I want other women that have had this experience to look at, you know, the the signs to look at what happens when you go through something like this. So that's really important. And it wasn't until 2017 that I decided to get the regression, you know, because I uh after uh you know all these years um one of the things that my partner would tell me was like don't you dare talk about et contact don't you dare talk about the hybridization program
program, my family would tell me the same thing Mm -hmm. because they would say, you're going to ruin your career. Mm -hmm. You don't want to talk about that. If people Google your business and they look that this person believes in aliens, you know, they're not going to take you serious. So that was hard for me as well, because my, my thing is about being authentic, speaking my truth, you know, and I didn't know what it meant to discuss this topic at that point. Obviously, I was just thinking I'm going to share my experience and see if anyone else had the experience. And at the time, I was doing a lot of uh, on, on the internet, you know, I was like hybrid children. I kept right. looking that up and there was limited information, Jimmy. There's a, there was a couple of things. I mean, I found Bridget Nielsen. I found her website and I was able to look at some of the stories, but someone that sits there and tells you, this is the hybridization program. This is what happens. This is what doesn't happen. Here are the possibilities. Uh, here's what to do with the medical side of it. You know, nothing like that. So there's very little support, you know, and this is not something that just affects women. It affects men, of course. So in 2017, I um, decided to end my relationship. You know, we just didn't see eye to eye regarding any of this, really. I mean, including spirituality and the need to discuss this topic, which is very important to me. And so we parted ways. And I all of a sudden, uh, I, my mother was the one that actually sent a video of a regression where someone had been talking about contact on Alba's, uh, you know, website on her channel. And so I was fascinated. I was like, wow, I really need that regression. And I said, wow, so regression could be a way for me to access the memories of what had happened. And I contacted, uh, you know, Alba, I set up an appointment, I actually got one. It's very hard to get an appointment with Alba. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. As you know, Jimmy. Yes. So it was kind of like, I guess, uh, in some way, fate or meant to be. And I ended up on her you know, on her couch, you could say, um, I flew all the way to um, Kansas, Kansas, Ohio, around there. And uh, we had her first session. And it was just amazing. It was amazing. And she clarified my answer that I had had the contact experience. For me, Jimmy, I want to be clear, what I work on, and one of the most important things for me is that I had been working really hard throughout these years to kind of destroy and question myself and all the programs that limit me from understanding um, the difference between what is reality and illusion, okay? Mm -hmm. And I was doing that because I really wanted to check myself. I wanted to know, you know, why I had experienced such a thing. I wanted to understand emotionally what what I was going through. I wanted to organize organize my emotions really clearly and any kinds of thoughts and feelings that were false I wanted to get rid of so I could be 100% authentic and that really led me to kind of a soul search and try to find these answers on a deeper level so I had been meditating up to 4 hours a day um trying to you know work on myself you know find that that inner inner connection to answer these questions and when I went to Alba I was really at a place where I was like, here are my questions. I want to understand what's happening. I I don't watch TV. You know, I live a really healthy lifestyle. I don't watch movies. I try to keep my mind really clean and clear from any kind of distraction so I can kind of be a clear channel to what I was going to receive at that point. So that's something that's really important. You know, I was not, um, I didn't want to watch any sci-fi movies or anything because I understand psych- psychology. I understand consciousness. I mean, when we put ourselves out in front of a television or listening to music, you know, we're receiving these kinds of, um, uh, you know, vibrational frequencies that are imprinting in our subconscious mind and shifting how we look and experience things. And they can take you very easily away from what's real, what's your true experience. Um, well, that's certainly true. And we'll discuss more of that uh, right after the break. And we do need to uh, be careful. It, it's because of what you just went through. And now you're questioning yourself. You need to be clean and pure at that point. You, you don't want to you don't want to you don't want to screw anything else up as well. It's 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 a two way street. This is fade to black. Our guest tonight. Uh, uh, hold on for a second. I am going to back up. Okay. Sorry about that. I was distracted with the text. Geraldine Orozco is with us. Now, I know everybody wants to know what happened on that Friday night. We'll start right there after this short break. Stay with us. Welcome 
Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, night one of our amazing women week here on Fade to Black. Geraldine Roscoe is with us. Tomorrow night, Hanovi Strong Deer. Wednesday night, Kathleen Martin. Thursday night, Dr. Lynn Katai. Tonight is Geraldine Orozco. Now, Geraldine, we've done a nice setup for where we're about to uh, uh, go right now, which is back to October of uh, uh, 2013, that Friday night. What happened? All right. So, yes, I mean, it was uh, a normal night like any other night until about 3.33 in the morning, exactly 3.33 in the morning. I wake up and I wake up to a very bright light in my room. Now, I have blinds in my room, those mini blinds, and uh, my house is located on a curving street. So in order for a car to come and shine their light at my window, it would have to be uh, on the other side, on the opposite side of the street you know angled towards my my window so i i noticed that the light was extremely strong and bright and i was thinking you know who must who must be shining this light at my my room at this time so when i look down at my phone it says exactly 333 i'm like oh cool you know because at that moment i didn't even have those kind of repetitive numbers that some people have when they're waking up spiritually i didn't know anything about that yet so I, it was just cool to me. And I was like, okay, let me get out of bed. After a few minutes, I waited. I sat up on my bed. I waited and I was like, when is it going to turn off? It never turned off. So I got out of bed. I went to my window. And as I'm looking through the blinds, the light gets brighter. And it gets so bright that it literally, it hurts my eyes to see it. You know, it's almost as if you're looking at a really bright light bulb or at the sun, basically. And it is pure white light, okay? And as I'm looking beyond that light, trying to see you know, is it a car? Like, what is that? I'm seeing a metallic, a beautiful, shiny, metallic material that's on the left side of that white, uh, white light. And um, my house is my, my, my bedroom is actually located right over my garage on the second floor. So, you know, as I'm looking down, I'm looking at this craft, this gigantic light and silver edges on the two sides to the left and to the right. And out of this bright light, all of a sudden, I become absolutely paralyzed. I can't move. All I can move is my pupils. And I am taken out of my bedroom window. I'm taking through the through the window to, to the other side. And when I get to the other side, there are these tall six shadows that are approaching from you know they they get from small to big they enlarge they come closer to me and as i'm as they get closer to me i'm clearly seeing their faces and i'm horrified because these are about six foot tall grays um uh six no there are six of them that are 10 feet tall so they're huge they're huge and they have these gigantic eyes and, um, you know, I'm looking at their eyes, these black, gigantic eyes that, you know, traditionally we, we see these grays that we call them. And the bright light is basically uh, one of them approaches closer to me and I'm horrified. I don't know what to do at that point. But as he comes close to me, he waves his hand and basically says calm telepathically in my mind. I, I hear calm and my body stops shaking. It stops feeling terror and I get brought into the craft with them and this is very vivid because I can see the craft I can see the entrance of the craft I can see the ridges on the floor I can see you know like the metallic um almost like uh, how can I describe it like a railing that is on the floor and then on the back of it when I'm entering the craft I'm seeing like these little bars and everything in great detail and I'm being brought in and as I'm being brought into to the left of this craft all of a sudden he lifts his hand and waves it and everything around me completely changes and I am now in this green uh, grassy space with a blue sky and there are these gigantic beautiful modern obtuse buildings and as I'm being brought into this um, you know it's a it's basically what it looks like is a holographic projection because the green grass looks fake and it also looks like it's pixelated believe you know I'm okay. looking at pixelated grass and um, you know, it just doesn't seem real. It doesn't seem, it looks like plastic. And I'm looking at the sky. The sky is, you know, fake blue, clearly. And as I'm being brought into this building, um, I'm left alone somehow, almost as if I'm hovering, it feels, because I can't quite 
connect with my body at that point. I can't feel whether I'm walking or not. I wanted that. Being... Let me let me jump in. I actually wanted to ask you that. Yeah. Uh, when uh, you uh, approached the craft, were you walking away from your house? Did you walk into the craft? Were you following them? I mean, not voluntarily. Well, maybe voluntarily. But were you walking? You no, know, you know, that's the thing. Like I, I'd gone through this in my mind trying to trace whether I felt myself actually stepping on things. And no, right, it's, right. it's as if you are being like they're gliding you right. into the craft, you know. Um, you, you can't feel your body at that point. I mean, you're I'm completely paralyzed. I can't move anything. So, um, you know, I don't have any like response coming from my legs or my, my arms. But as I'm, uh, in this case, being brought into this building, uh, I'm seeing uh, something that looks like a table. Like it, this is a holographic projection. Again, I'm, I'm clear that it is, but it's such an exquisitely made pro- of holographic projection that it does look real right um and beyond that i'm seeing uh something that looks like a little japanese garden behind this this obstuse uh building that they brought me into very modern very minimalistic so as i turn around from there and at this point i can recall that i was walking i'm I'm turning around i'm moving my feet to turn around because they have left they left me inside of this building what i see is a tall gray and another shadow of a woman and as they're walking in front of me I'm looking and it's my aunt and she has her hair. She has this really thick hair and bangs and she's in her pajamas that I know that she wears and she's there in front of me and they're walking with her into, you know, right in front of me in front of this building. Is your aunt alive? Yes. Okay. That's, that's interesting. Okay. Continue. Yes. Trust me, we're yes. going to get into this because what what I'll what you'll find out is that my entire family are actually contactees, and we, you know, through my experience, we have all kind of come out to with these things. You know, they've all had regressions at this point. So um, she is, so she's walking in front of me, and I I get scared because I'm like my stomach goes into a knot, and I'm like, what is she doing here? You know, and I'm seeing the gray go in front of me and immediately everything changes again. Everything is gone in front of me. And now I'm inside of the craft again and I can see the craft. It's like this metallic material that it looks actually translucent because I can see through to what looks like stars on the other side. It's as if I'm in space now. Okay. And, um, you know, in front of me are the three grays. To the right of me is this beautiful table with a blue light with a holographic projection of planets and stars and And it looks like uh, what could be some kind of a navigation type of a table, hologram. I mean, the holograms are beautiful. I love technology. So when I saw something like that, I'm also an interior and architectural designer. So when I see things like this, it's just magnificent to me. You know, and beyond that, I'm seeing what looks like a control panel of some sort with like buttons. And, you know, it's um, they brought me into another part of the craft and directly in front of me. There are three grays there are two talls and one short. And he basically opens up this holographic cubicle um, uh, cube in front of me. And uh, it's it has eight layers to it. And the first one opens up. Okay, they open up in front of us. So we're in this large room. I'm in front of this uh, 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 little cubicle hologram, this blue hologram. And the first one opens up and it's this alien writing that starts appearing in front of me. And the it was so fast and I was looking at it and I was like, oh my gosh, I have to remember this. I can never seen anything like this. I have to remember this when when I get back, basically I'm thinking. So, you know, I have somewhat of a holo- of a um, photographic memory. So I'm trying to remember as much as I can. So they show me this language. Then they move that out and the next layer opens up and I'm shown a hologram of planets. The planets zoom open in front of us. They expand around us. And next thing you know, I'm around me. They change the settings of this environment once again. And I'm on Pleiades, supposedly. And they are showing me here Pleiades, this planet. Uh, you know, there's something that looks like grass. There are mountains. There's a blue sky. And there are these four, this little 
crowd of four beings in front of me that are more like humanoids, very tall, slender beings. So they show me those beings. And what they're telling me telepathically is that they are from Maya, that we are basically on Maya, which is one of the planets of the seven um, Pleiades constellations. And they are telling me that this is where I come from and I have been here before. And they zoom out and they show me another scene, which I'm here in front of this crowd of people speaking. And then they remove this hologram from around us. We're back in the craft and they go back to the hologram and they show me the next box inside of this uh, cube. This hologram is eight little lights. They're yellow lights. They zoom the yellow lights in front of me. And four of those lights start to expand in front of me. And one of them is a child. It is a a beautiful, blonde, very slender, thin child with these magnificent blue eyes um, and a really soft, curly hair that seems like, um, you know, very thinning kind of hair. It doesn't seem like um, actual hair. I don't know how to, it almost does, and this is going to sound funny, but it's going to, it's like pasta, but really thin. You can tell that it's really frail. And so this child shows up in front of me. And immediately when I, when I make eye contact with the child, I recognize this child as my own. And I am immediately taken over by this emotion of uh, love and affection for the child and recognition. And I'm like, that's my child. And I'm uh, this maternal instinct comes in where I want to give it love. And and I'm like, where does this child come from? And the telepathic connection that I'm having with the child is basically him uh, recognizing me. But when I say me, what I'm getting flashes in my mind is myself, my entire human life, and flashes of other aspects of myself that are beyond that life. Was that, this was was this mm-hmm. uh, holographic image? Are you suggesting that it was in real time that this child could see you as well? Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, he could see me. Uh, the child has now become, I guess, what we would think as a, as a real being in front of me. Um, yeah, almost like FaceTime. And I'm not, I'm not being cavalier here, right? I mean, yeah. well, right? No, this was a direct communication. It's direct. I mean, he is in front of me. The child is has materialized in front of me in the flesh. Oh. Okay. So from hologram to flesh. Is Got what you. I'm, okay. You know, so, so that that was the interesting thing about it, and how I know that is because the warmth of the body, and it was not translucent like the other holograms. Like right. some of the other holograms were slightly translucent, but this was not. This was a a child in the flesh in front of me, um, and the you know when you're close to someone, you can feel their energy. So I can feel this child, and the child can feel me, and. Uh, so any, in any way, I'm, I'm introduced to four of these children. One of them was an older reptilian type of, and when I say hybrid, hybrid, hybridization is the combination of species. So this is a human mixed with another species. Okay, so this child looks humanoid, but he also looks gray in a sense where his the shape of his head is enlarged, his eyes are enlarged, his body is frail, it looks very angular, bony. Um, the reptilian one has these reptilian eyes that also look that they're mixed with human and he has almost something that looks like a scaly material on his face and uh, hor- like some kind of... Um, horn that are like protruding from his head through his hair so you know the feelings are mixed jimmy because i'm looking at these children and they look half human and they're supposed to be mine and at that point my thought is not you know it doesn't even occur to me how did they come to be it's just wow they're so beautiful and i know they're mine and this emotion comes up, like, how come I didn't know about them? How is it that they're existing without me, without their mother? Uh, you know, how can they do this? You don't well, even know. We, who we know to. baby reptilians are always cute. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so, but, but, but let me back up for a second. You, you kind of, so the, the gold, uh, the gold balls of light, it's the same <laughs> process, right? So the first child materializes. 
the the second one was one of those gold dots as well, right? That it's... materialized, went through the same process, mm-hmm. and appeared. Okay, uh, and and number three. Number three. Number three is a is a beautiful girl. She's blonde hair. She right. has these blue eyes, and she basically has a human eye, but the pupil is like a cat eye. So that means that there's. So the pupil will move sideways and it will change. You know how it contracts and, and you know, with the light? Sure. The, pu- the pupil does that. It is, so, I mean, it's just mind-blowing. So you're looking at it and you're like, what am I looking at here? Um, but, you know, she's very beautiful in a sense where her face has gigantic eyes, very small, delicate features, very frail, thin skin, uh, hair, which is also thin. Um, so, so you, let me let me jump in again. I got to do this. I got to do this yeah. for clarification. Okay, so you said she was a girl. So the first two were little boys. Yeah. Okay, yeah. got you, got you. Yeah, let me kind of give you an idea of the ages just so you understand the timeline because I'm going to go into more of this also as we go through my experience through my life because this first child was probably around, I'm going to say eight years old. The second one was probably in his 20s. He was much older. He was taller. Um, This little girl is probably around four or five years old. Okay. Now, something I really want to mention about this little girl, which is important, is that this beautiful little girl is someone that I had seen before. Uh, When I was a child, when I was about six, seven years old, I had a dream, a recurring dream that my mother would bring, holding her hand, this young girl, this exact child, to me. And at that time, I was thinking that that dream, I was thinking, oh, maybe my mom's going to get pregnant. You know, maybe she's going to get pregnant with a sister. Right. That's what I was thinking at that time. Or maybe this is my future child. I was thinking in the future. Um, you did, know, they, so, did they call you mom? You no, know, it's not a matter of mom. You know what it is? It's this telepathic re- recognition um, that it goes beyond mom. It's just like, I am a part of you. That's, but they, that's but you did, saying. you did have that. How do I say this? You did have that that telepathic conversation or understanding that yeah. they were yours. That's right. That's wow. right. Wow. And that's the most shocking part of this experience, Jimmy, because that I will never in my life forget that initial contact with them. I mean, to this day, um, what I say is that it's realer than real life. This this experience, you know, I can I can't remember what I did last week, but I sure as hell can remember every detail of this. I bet that's you can. Is, okay. You know? Number four. Yeah. So number four is is another girl, uh, probably around seven years old, with brown hair and blue eyes. Uh, and this one was the one that most resembled my face shape and uh, energy. And when I say energy, I'm talking about a more human type of energy, which means that she had more emotion. The other ones did not te- send uh, have feelings like that. It was it, very different, very, you know, when I say feelings, these, these hybrids have a very complex, profound understanding of connection. And it comes from a place that is much more uh, a view that is much more expansive, more universal. It's like, I recognize you that I come from you, but I am my own individual organism of life. And I'm here sharing space with you. That's the best way that I can explain the kind of uh, connection that is occurring, the transmitting of information that's occurring between us. So that's kind of how how it was. So those are the four children that I was presented in the flesh. The other lights disappeared because at that point I was an emotional wreck. You know, I was thinking, oh, my God, these are my children. Are those also my children? What's happening? I'm going into a panic at this point. And the they so they basically removed them out of my sight. And I'm back into the in this craft looking at the last blue tray, the, this cubicle tray, this holographic tray that they bring in front of me. And from there comes out a planet, the planet Earth. And they're like, why are you suffering? This is what they're telling me telepathically. Don't you understand that we are all interconnected? And what they do next is they show me the planet Earth. They zoom into this field of flowers. And the field of flowers, they zoom in down to, I guess you can say, the molecular level of that flower. And they show me what looks like the matrix 
uh, what we have seen, what we have been shown in the film, The Matrix, these numbers, these sequences, these algorithms that make up this flower, and they zoom out and they show me a cityscape. And the cityscape is made out of the algorithms and numbers. And the only thing that's different from that is that the humans have a certain light within them, some kind of a yellow light at the center of their core. So they're showing me all of this to try to help me comprehend that we are all, that the only thing that is real from all of this are the humans. And they take me after that. It was a very emotional kind of realization because they take me, uh, I guess, upon my return. Um, you know, they're, they they changed the space of this environment into a nebula. And I'm feeling that I'm floating in this nebula. And I'm feeling the most overpowering feeling of peace and disconnect from anything in my life, my worries, my stress, my anxiety, my family, my friends, any kind of um, perceptions of my role as a human, playing the human life role, sure. all of that disappears. And I'm, I just feel this incredible peace. You know, and I've always tried to recreate that in my meditations. And, you know, this nebula was so amazing. I use this in a lot of my marketing now for my meditation practice, because it reminds me of that experience. And next thing you know, I'm, uh, you know, basically opening my eyes upside down on the side of my bed. So that that is what happened. So you um, when you were it's like you were spacewalking right out in space, but without a spacesuit. <laughs> right, right. That's what it felt like. It's like you're just basically hovering in the middle of a nebula, and it's that uh, rainbow nebula that's, you know, quite famous. Uh, of course, you know, that's not really what's happening. You know, what's happening is that they're taking things that you're familiar with in your subconscious mind, and they're projecting it in front of sure, you. Sure, it's an artificial reality. Right, exactly. You know, but what's mem memorable about that and what um, is that feeling of being an infinite amount of peace it is just irreplicable you know unless you meditate a really long time sure. you won't understand what that means so sure. it's really powerful yeah. so you uh will we'll pick this up when we come back after the break but uh the next thing that you remember is you opening up your eyes so they didn't like just right. drop you off and kick you out of the car <laughs> Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't pull over to the side of the road and leave you standing there you woke up uh, your eyes pop open in your bed. At that moment, we've got one minute left. Uh, describe what you were thinking. So first of all, it was nausea, okay, right. and confusion. And the first thing I did was I drew down the symbols that I remembered from what what, what I was shown, the writing. And I, I filled three pages of that in my notebook. Have three you, pages. have you, I know you have, who, who have you shown it to? Well, I, I put it in my presentation, but you know, something interesting happened that, uh, you know, what happened is that I, after all this experience, after I tried to show my partner when I was in a relationship and everything, and I, I was discouraged after a couple of years because no one wanted to hear my story, basically, in my family. They're like, no, don't talk about it. Right. And I put that notebook in the garage. And next thing you know, when I went back to that in 2018 to make a presentation, for a conference that I had been asked to speak to, the pages were ripped out of the notebook. Shut up. No, no. I, I really, I don't even know how to explain that. But, uh, I mean, I cried because I was like, what happened? I mean, I was like, because, you know, I had moved, but who's going to remember that that book even had those things, you know? And so uh, I don't even know how to explain that, but I, I recreated as much as I can remember. Cause again, like I'm telling you that experience is, is realer than real life, you know? So everything in detail, I, I still remember. And I was able to recreate some of that, which I do put in my presentation. Um, I have shown some, some people that uh, uh, translate light language supposedly. And what I have found out in my own regression is that this, is basically telling me all of the things that I was going to be privy to in the regression with Alba, uh, you know, that July in 2017. Let's take our break right here. Our guest tonight, Geraldine Orozco. Night one of our Amazing Women Week right here on Fade to Black. Tomorrow night, Hanovi Strong Deer. Wednesday night, Kathleen Martin. Thursday night, Dr. Lynn Katai. We'll be right back after this short break. Stay with us.
Welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your Jimmy Church. You can follow me on Twitter at jchurchradio. And we have uh, Geraldine's uh, links up. And it's at Intro Alchemy right there in Twitter. You can go and follow uh, Geraldine. Now, pretty incredible experience uh, to go through. Um, I want to discuss, obviously, what happens next. But um, for you, panic, hyperventilating, were you calm? Uh, You know, what was going through your mind at that moment when you opened up your eyes? Um, At first, I would say it was a bit of panic, I have to say. Uh, sure. You know, I felt nauseous. My body felt so sore. So I was like, what just happened to me? And but but I got to tell you, I mean, I was thinking, you know, there should be a book on how to get abducted because, you know, now looking back, you know, you have the tell, telltale signs of what to look for, what to kind of, you know, see and, you know, how to experience and what to the signs that, you know, I didn't know if I should look at my body or anything like that. So I didn't look for marks. I didn't look for, for anything thing. To me, it was just this amazing experience that I had met these children. And I didn't know what to make of it. I didn't know what to think of it. I myself was not even sure if that was a dream or I had really been abducted because I hadn't heard about abduction before Jimmy. What time? What time did the what time did the clock say? Uh, well, it was three thirty-three when I left. It was six something when I got back. Six, wow. probably six twenty something, six twenty-five. I want to say, yeah, something like that. So mm-hmm. that's how much time. Do you was. think? Uh, do you think that you physically were transported, or that the craft moved? I do believe. I do believe that it moved. I believe that it was there on top of my window. I mean, I saw it with my own eyes. Sure. And I was brought in, and I was taken out. And I believe that we, you know, we were returned. I was returned, you know, to my to my bed. Because how would I end up upside down on the side of my bed? And my bed was open. You know, that I, I, I'm a very, um, I, I don't move like that. I'm not like one of those crazy sleepers that move around. I don't have any sleeping disorders of any kind, you know. So it just doesn't happen. Now, so you... Weird. Uh, that was in uh, October of 2017. You had your regressions with Alba in November or 2013. You had your uh, regressions with Alba in 2017. Right. Um, and you said that there was no contact between then and the regressions. Have you had contact since? Yes. Okay, yes. so that'll be the, that's the next phase of this conversation. Okay. <laughs> okay. So so okay, we've got a, a four year gap there, but what happens next in in your contact? Uh, well, here's the thing that I that I want to say. I mean, whether I had contact during those years, uh, I'm telling you, I had miscarriages. So the question, the answer is, I had contact then. I just wasn't conscious of it right 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 right. and um but my contact now since then uh and i should say since i've been public with this uh since i began to speak has been a different kind jimmy um you know my contact has been aware of the et presence uh more than ever it's almost as if as i purify my body more and more things happened uh i had a near-death experience at the beginning of last year and that opened my senses once again to another level in which not only did i start speaking light language uh for those of you that don't know what light language is the best way i can explain it is basically uh i guess ex- um you know, an alien dialect is is what I, what I'm talking about. It's like vibrational frequency that you speak. I didn't know what that was when that happened to me either. Um, and uh, I also started to work and see holographically when I was working with my patients, with my clients, um, meaning that I could see uh, the body on a holographic level, work with their chakras. Uh, so that was not contact but what happened after that is interesting and my contact changed to um, uh, military abduction now okay so uh, again I don't I never knew what that was prior to this occurring but um, I was speaking at a conference in Colorado and one evening uh, at my arrival at that conference um, I got taken at four something in the morning um, to an underground base 
And this is a very interesting experience because it involves two other people that were there in the room with me. Okay. Okay. And uh, so what what happens is I wake up with a nightmare. Supposedly, my nightmare is that this this gray alien has gray hands and is in, in injecting into my right arm with a syringe, a very large yellow liquid syringe into my arm. And I'm basically being held down and I'm screaming, no, 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 you know, don't take me. Don't, don't do that. And uh, I wake up and when I wake up, I'm screaming out something. I yell out something. And so I was so embarrassed because I'm sharing the room with another person next to me uh, and one person underneath me in the bunk bed. This is an Airbnb that we had, that they had, um, hired for us since we're speaking at that conference. And, um, you know, what I, what I notice is that my sweater is wet. It's soaking wet. The whole front of the sweater is soaking wet and it has kind of like a cowl neck. So it's like two layers of wet. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm like, how did that happen? And it's like a circle. It's not like the entire sweater is wet. So anyway, I'm exhausted. We had just driven from Las Vegas all the way to Colorado. I'm dead and I have to speak the next day. So I was dead and I wanted to just go to bed and I, I thought it was just a bad dream. So I pick up another sweater. I change my sweater. I go back to sleep. That next Sunday, uh, when we were driving back home to Las Vegas, I'm in the car and I'm talking to one of the girls that was with me and I'm telling her, Hey, you know, I, I last the other night I had a nightmare. Do you recall that? She said, yeah, you know, you yelled, you woke up and yelled something. I actually woke up right before you woke up and I was having a dream about you. And I said, Oh, interesting. What were you dreaming about? So she begins to tell me basically my dream that we are being strapped down on these, uh, kind of, uh, a dentist type of chair, but it's more like a seat. It's not like something that you lay on and I'm being injected and there's this ET um, being in front of me. And so, you know, I, I get, obviously, I, you know, my, my stomach drops and she starts to tell me that and we end up having the exact same dream. Uh, it turns out that we both get regressed and indeed it was a my lab um, military abduction my lab, which we get taken to an underground base in Colorado, and we are injected and implanted. And the back, so the, the interesting thing is that my back, my back was hurting so bad that I could not walk for the next three months. I couldn't, I do yoga every day. I couldn't do yoga. You know, I couldn't do anything. Um, and I, and, you know, I had these little pin marks on the middle of my back. And, um, you know, it was just, it was, it was pretty amazing. But what makes that amazing is that a couple months later, I was speaking at another conference, and I run into the other lady that we saw in the regression that had also been taken. And uh, when I go up to her, I, n I never knew her before this, you know, I never really met her formally. But I said, Hi, she's like, Hi, do you remember me? And I said, you know, do you remember what happened? Any I mean, I asked her, do you recall anything that occurred that night? And she's like, um, oh, yes. Are you white van? She says to me, do you recall that white van? And at that moment, I mean, I had a chill sent down my spine because what happened is that we had been taken out of the Airbnb. We had been put into a white van. We had been taken 15 minutes out into this open field in Colorado in the middle of nowhere. We were at UFO highway. I don't know if some of you know where that is. It's in, uh, um, Moffitt. It's by Moffitt, Colorado. And uh, we were taken 25 floors underground. And um, I mean, it was just, it was horrible. You know, she was taken one direction. I was taking another direction with this other woman. We were taken down eight floors further down into this um, room, you know, and I, and I go really deep into this in the regression, but uh, it was pretty traumatizing, Jimmy. And after that, it kind of took me on a different understanding that these things are not only extraterrestrial they're also happening terrestrially you know, okay uh, let's let's uh let's get to specifics here sure. uh with this because saying that uh it's a military abduction uh you know a white a white van i almost said white chevy van i don't know <laughs> but uh bad. it's an old song from the 70s um but you uh uh you, you're you're taken in a white van were there military personnel in uniform around you you mentioned a gray doing the injection of the yellow with the sh the sh syringe but uh did you see military personnel around you 
Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Um, of course. Uh, so let me clarify. When we did the regression, um, it was military. Uh, the men that took us out of the, the room were wearing all black military uh, clothing. They had military boots. Um, you know, they had no insignias or anything on their body. It was just black, completely black with, with hats. And uh you know, they had these belts with, with things on them. I don't know what, what things they had on their belts, but they were like heavily something belts with stuff on it. And uh, when we were taken down, so so in the dream, so this is what happens. The dream shows me a gray alien that's coming towards me with an injection. And uh, in the regression, as I'm in front of this being, all of a sudden, the image of his gray face now fades away, and it is actually hands of a man. So it, this is a now a man. So what happens is that their technology is quite advanced, and this is important to note for those of you that have had abduction experiences or contact experiences, that a lot of times these beings are screening. They're using technology to screen themselves and change, you know, the way that you are experiencing something or how you're seeing it, how you're recalling it. And so what they'll do is they'll put a screen image of something. In this case, they put it a alien and uh, a gray. And what it is really is that it's uh, some kind of a doctor or a medical, uh, you know, personnel that's actually injecting me in that underground base um i am um, when we get taken down to that underground base i'm undressed completely naked i'm uh washed down in something that looks like uh you know one of those walk-in showers i'm being put onto uh these basically like a wheelchair taken into the room next door the room next door has a gigantic window in the back that's uh going into some kind of a control room on the, on another side it has a mirror and this room has four different of these little chairs that are um basically like what do they look like they look like stools but they have a long back which attaches to the back with these um you know these clamps it has clamps for the arms and it has clamps for the legs so we're sat down on there with something that looks like a uh, it looks like one of those, uh, you know, hospital gowns, but they're very small and they're barely covering the body. So I'm naked. The other woman is naked and she's sitting to my right. And How did you know it was uh, 25 floors down? Yeah. In, in the regression, uh, you know, I the thing about me is that what, what I happen is that because I think it's because I meditate a lot that I work on my consciousness. So. I really try to focus on having a, a photographic memory. And when I'm being taken down, we arrive when the, when the, um, when the elevator. So, so let me take you back. We're going in the field. The field opens up these two doors on the floor next to a power line, which is to the right of this entrance. We go into something that looks like a cage that the best thing I can describe, one of those miners, you know how the miners, they have those cage elevators that will take you down. It's just like that. So that the van goes into this cage, it drops down the, the lids or those doors close above us and it's pitch dark. We're taken all the way down to this first area and it was 25 floors that I'm seeing were going down. And um, when we get to that landing area, one of the women get taken out to the left into this something that looks like a hospital with large hallways and lights. It literally looks like a hospital. I'm seeing little panels on the walls. I'm seeing their lights, the dim lights that are like typical of underground um, bases, underground, you know, spaces. Uh, they're dim yellowish lights and it's very musky. It's like, you know, it, there's not a lot of air and then we're taken. And another thing I want to note is that you can see the rock, you know, rock or, or ground, the wall, half of the wall is ground, half of the wall is actually like, you know, an actual wall, a finished wall. And we get taken to the right to another elevator that takes us eight floors further down. And when we get to the very last eight floor there. Um, they take us to the left and they take us down a long hallway. And this looks like um, like a hospital. The doors have little windows on them with those um, little, what is it, like, not like bars, but you know that glass, I guess, I don't know if it's like bu bulletproof or something like that. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. You know, It has those little lines on them. 
Um, so, so, you know, I'm taken into this room where it's like, it's blue tile, blue yucky tile, and they have a drain in the middle and they have these shower heads above and they basically wash our body and they take our clothes off, um, take our clothes off, wash our body. And then they take us into the room next door. So when we're being placed on these, uh, little, um, chairs, they're clamping our ankles and our hands and basically inserting into our body. So, in any case, this experience was pretty traumatic. I mean, I had marks on my right arm uh, from the injection, and I had the marks on my lower back. And in the regression, I go deep into looking. I'm very consciously aware of what's happening. Okay, so I'm seeing the screening removed in the in the regression. So now I see the man that's there. I see his his uh, you know, his medical clothing that he's wearing, and to the left, I'm seeing his assistants. I'm seeing them hold me down. I'm seeing the other girl, uh, lady, being um, put down as well. She's completely unconscious, looking at me with her mouth open, basically saliva dripping from her mouth. And, you know. Um, traumatic. So she, wow, that's. It, it, it's quite traumatic. That's I mean, quite I, traumatic. I have to tell you, you know, it was really hard. It was hard to kind of recover from that because I did not see that coming. <laughs> well, Moffitt uh, is, is in the middle of nowhere. You know, it's way south of Denver, southwest of Colorado Springs, in the middle of absolute nothingness. Mm -hmm. Um, This field, uh, so are you, in a general sense, are you guessing that it was, it it must have been close, you know, around the, it's not even a town, Moffat is, you know, it's just a few houses, Um, uh, but it was in that general area? Yes, absolutely. And I have been doing a lot of research on this because I'm writing about this in my book because this is, you know, we're talking about an underground base. There are several underground bases there in that area. And one of the things that I saw in my regression is that this is actually taking place at the Biological Nuclear Defense Department. It's managed by the Biological Nuclear Defense Department. Um, You know, and so there uh, there are many bases under un, underground that the uh, underground bases in that space, and one of the largest underground bases is north of that north of that place as well. And uh, you know, a lot of these are connected by tunnels. You know, so this was in the middle of nowhere. There's no main entrance. We're talking about a door that opens up in the field that looks like an electrical door next to a, a power line. You know, and you're basically being taken down there. And I have been spending tremendous amount of time with Google Earth sure. trying to figure out, you know, exactly where the hell they took me because I know it was 15 minutes. It was a 15 minute car ride from where we were. We were staying at an Airbnb that was close to the mountain. They took us out in the middle of nowhere in a field. So, you know, um, and this is next to UFO Watchtower. That's where we were, right. where we were speaking. Right. Um, Right, 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 right. Sugwachi County, yeah. So, so you know, this is a whole different thing. But what I what I want to say is that the reason why they took me down there is to take another form of genetic material, which comes from the spine. Okay, so this was this was something that you can call a spinal tap that they take information and the pain that I experienced for the next three months from that experience was. Ex- Excruciating. I mean, I couldn't even bend over slightly. I felt like my back was going to crack in half. Um, you know, so what happens is that a little bit later after that, my aunt had a similar experience. Okay. So she's a contactee as well. She lives here in, La- in Livermore. Um, and she had the same experience where she uh, had the dream of being taken by these beings that are injecting something into her body and her back and her neck. Right. And um, next thing you know, it's four in the morning. She's crawling to the toilet to, I'm sorry, you know, to um, release herself. And uh, she ends up at the hospital the next couple hours. She goes to the hospital. Um, the doctors do every test possible. They think it's pneumonia. They give her four different kinds of antibiotics. In three days, she's absolutely fine. The doctor doesn't know what happened to her. But she had this dream or this experience right before that happened. And she has her husband that's sleeping next to her. And her husband, you know, obviously he can't, he doesn't know what to do with that kind of a experience, you know. So, but when I hear this from her, and I was there at the hospital, her her neck was swollen like a like a softball in the back of her neck. Okay. Were, so were they extracting fluid from your back? 
Yeah, so what happens is that the information that they take, so the spinal cord holds uh, the purest form of genetic material for the body. Okay, so the spine is actually the first thing that is um, being created when you're born. So it holds like all of the main information that your organism needs uh, connected to the brain, right? So um, this is basically, uh, if, if anyone was to replicate someone, to make a clone out of someone, this is where you would want to use this information. Information. You take it from the spine. And so that's exactly what they were doing in this program. And of course, through regression, I was able to understand that because um, I was I identified the personnel that was in charge of the program and, you know, what they're doing uh, with that information. And, you know, what it comes out to be is that they are also creating a hybrid program, but this is more like a cloning of a pro- uh, cloning, human cloning kind of a program what do you feel i i recognize a connection to what happened back in 2013 they knew who you were and where you are where you were going to be and was this like how can i say this was this like a checkup right yeah you know i mean i I guess you could you could call it a checkup, but the question is to what end? I mean, right, to what right. end do they take uh, people, you know, and, and here's what I have understood from my experiences. I mean, when we're going to go through this, but I am a lifelong abductee. I have had my first experience happen when I was five years old. And when in that experience, I was implanted with technology that prepared my body for the hybridization program for a lifelong hybridization, you know, participation um, so I've had many abduction experiences at different ages, different stages of my life, which are, are, you know, those types of checkups. And my experiences are different. I have 24 hybrid children in three, now four different programs, the fourth being this military abduction. The three others are defined in my, in my best capacity as a uh, rep, uh, draconian reptilian agenda. Uh, a humanoid, I guess you can say Pleiadian agenda, and another one that is a reptilian uh, kind of an agenda, but we don't know if those are more high, high, you know, high vibration or low vibration. What I mean by that is that the reason why they're creating them is, uh, let's say, quote unquote, beneficial kind of uh, program that they're creating. Would you For- go back to, uh, we're going to head towards a break here. Would you go back to Colorado if you were invited? <laughs> oh god for to do my research maybe but i wouldn't spend the night there <laughs> <laughs> i know right yeah i gotta be honest yeah the uh when we come back uh after the break we're going to talk about uh the hybrid program and what seating is and of course you know what you spoke about in the film extraordinary the seating but for those out there when they hear this and they hear from you Or they go, oh, come on. Okay, this is a bit too much. It's one thing to see something in the sky, but now we're going somewhere else here with this. How do you respond uh, to those that would say that? And I understand why they would, too. Certainly you do. Of course, I understand completely. I I mean, I'm coming from a place where... I thought aliens was a joke. You know, I didn't know that that was a real thing. So I come, I comprehend completely. But, you know, we're looking at my regressions and my regressions are all public. You can go to the regression and see step by step how I was taken, how the insemination process happened, the gestation, how my body reacted to that. Right. When I look at my life in retrospect, I'm looking at how those abductions had affected me physically. And they were tremendous, tremendous, you know, effects I became sick. I ended up at the hospital. I have the the bills to prove it. I have the x-rays and the sonograms to prove those things, you know. So my life was completely changed because of this. And so for someone to want to make up something like this or want to fabricate, I mean, they really would have to be a tremendous lack of love where they need a tremendous amount of attention, you know, um, or something like that. But these things are things that are still affecting me. And, it, and it's changed my life. I sold my business. I'm no longer in what I'm doing. I dedicate my life to doing this work now, 
to talk about this because what I don't understand is I know I'm not the only person that has had this experience and even been public about it. But why are we not talking more about this? Because, um, you know, uh, there there has been a paper roll um, uh, uh, that, that was conducted, I mean, in, in 1991, where 3.7 million Americans feel that they have been abducted. And from there, 20% of those have been participants of the hybridization program. So why are we not talking about this? Because the women that I talk to are getting pregnant, they're having miscarriages, they're having dreams, they're having the, you know, the needle marks on their hand. Even this just yesterday, I was at Yvonne Smith's Zero Group, and I'm hearing the exact same things. So this is serious. I mean, we're not talking about people fabricating things we're talking about your life being changed completely by this let's take you know, our well, let me jump in let's take our break right here our guest tonight geraldine orozco first time guest amazing conversation first night of our amazing women week here on fade to black we'll be right back after this short break stay with us Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Our guest tonight, Geraldine Orozco. An amazing, amazing conversation uh, going on right now. And we're going to continue this. Uh, Geraldine, uh, the new film, Extraordinary, the Seating, uh, gets released uh, September 3rd. And having your your story out there now, in a, <laughs> we're talking about a feature film, uh, is something that needed to be done. Um, are you comfortable with uh, with the exposure you're about to receive? Yes. Uh, to be honest, I'm not sure what that means, actually. <laughs> you know, I've never had that kind of uh, limelight or attention. But uh, for me, Jimmy, uh, again, as I was saying before our break, the important thing for me is to connect with those that are have experienced, uh, you know, being, uh, you know, being uh, told to be quiet for so many years, you know, to not talk about this, to not discuss it, to not even ask questions about it. And because of fear of embarrassment, that really has to stop. Like many things that are happening right now in our reality, we're going through kind of an, I guess, a collective awakening where we're really checking ourselves and questioning, you know, why is it not okay to be 100% authentic and real with the things that are happening? So for me, uh, the women that are experiencing this are experiencing real things. They have the medical bills to prove it. They have the body uh, marks and uh, emotional trauma to prove what is occurring here. So it can't be that we're all experiencing some psychotic stasis, you know, that we are, that's inexplicable. This has been happening for a very long time. And further than that, this has been happening since the very beginning of life on this planet. You know, it's my understanding that we are a hybridized race. And this is what I have been shown through my awakening, my understanding, my research. So this is something that we need to start getting serious. We need to educate ourselves on what that means, because our entire reality will be um, disrupted in a sense. You know, we're, we're, you know, look, questioning reality, we're questioning our historical timeline, we're, we're, we're questioning our bodies and the importance of being human. And that's really where our attention needs to be before we continue living like zombies in our everyday jobs, you know, going through these same, you know, routines that we're doing, sleeping, following along in the programs that are, um, you know, enlisted by this society. Sure. We really have to question that. So that's why I, you know, kind of, uh, kind of surrendered and I really, you know, gave myself as an example to this, uh, you know, I'm single, I, I don't have children, I'm very happy to speak on this topic, you know, clearly with those that need to hear it and provide all the education possible. Um, you know, and that's why I, I founded hybridmother.com, which is going to be a place for people to receive information, support, education, serious education, not just, um, you know, it's a beautiful experience and it's wonderful and it's okay. There's two sides to everything. And I, th I believe for us to understand truth, we need to look at both sides very, very honestly, you know. Now, so, well, okay, um, yeah. let's, uh, the, the program, I see 
two, well, it's probably many, but two things are actually going on here. One, your children that uh, that you met, they're not on this planet, right? They are somewhere else, correct? That's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then there's another side of this program where the that that hybridization they are living on this planet right two different programs correct and and you're correct to say that there are many because there are hundreds of programs um and basically if you go back to the very beginning of life sitting on this planet what i have found in my research is that there are three main lineages that DNA lineages that have seeded life on this planet and from those lineages have been preserved very heavily these bloodlines that have then created our human race and how I know that is that you know if we look at our history I mean if you look at the book of Enoch if you look at the emerald tablets if you look at the book of Gilgamesh we, we understand that we have uh, looked at gods or those that come from above like um, you know like these gods that have come down and they have combined with humans to create other beings and that's been recorded in a lot of um, you know in our historical timeline through art through uh, petroglyphs all around the world that depict such a thing um, and a lot of fol folklore and uh, myths in history. So we have to kind of take a look at that and understand how history has kind of changed and why we haven't been discussing that. Because when we look at the DNA lineages in our in our current timeline here in America, and even uh, so as to look at our presidential lineages, what you're going to see is that there are a couple main lines of information, which are lineages that are ruling where we live in right now, okay? So um, some of these bloodlines that have gone from Mesopotamia to Egypt to Italy to the UK have then gone to the US, and these are lineages, family lines that are preserved very heavily, that from those family lines have then created some kind of organization of power. Uh, as a matter of fact, in our world, there are 147 companies that run the world. They own all of these companies. They're umbrella companies that are basically who, who are feeding us, the pharmaceutical companies, everything around us. And what I found is that these lineages, these um, families are related. They're interrelated, these families. They're specific bloodlines. And so, of course, before I had my regression, I didn't know any of this. But as I research and try to understand this, this is this is the conclusion of the research. So when we're looking at each other here, just a thousand years ago, you and I had someone in common, me and you, Jimmy. And I don't even know you. I just met you, Jimmy. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is for all of us. So what has happened in our evolutionary timeline that we have all descended from certain specific family lineages? Um, I think that's something that's incredibly important to note. And the way that these D DNA lineages have evolved is also important. We are constantly being genetically modified by the food that we're eating, by the pharmaceutical um, that we are taking. Our entire environment is writing constantly our DNA. So if you take that into consideration, genetic mo modification is not something that's so far out there. I mean, we're constantly being genetically modified. You know, we... we understand that through um, epigenetics, which we are starting to comprehend how DNA is even written. Uh, in my last conference at uh, UFO Megacon, I discuss holographic DNA. Um, you know, and so what we're talking about here is that the hybridization program is something that has been originated in Mesopotamia all the way until our present day. But because we live in a multidimensional reality, you know, these are also being taken places on other dimensions. We, we need to start becoming comfortable with the concept that we live in a multidimensional reality. Um, these extraterrestrials that are perhaps more advanced uh, civilizations, races, they hold a tremendous amount of advanced technology. I mean, our technology is a joke. Right. Right. So um, these beings that come, they take genetic material from humans, which, again, is a genetically modified race with certain information. What does that mean? DNA 
holds tremendous, massive amounts of information. Here in Silicon Valley, they are using DNA as an um, as a you know uh, as an example. And they are trying to utilize, they're learning how to program into DNA through frequency, through sound, through algorithms, through computer systems to store massive amount of information. So we are a massive storage system. And depending on how we are modified, we can be uh We can be changed, we can be added, our entire body can be changed, Um, our consciousness, what we are experiencing can be altered, just as in these abduction experiences where they screen things and they make you believe that you're experiencing one thing when in reality you're experiencing something else. So that right there kind of shows you the kind of technology that these beings have. Um, In one of my uh, uh, regressions, I'm taken aboard uh, a hybridization craft. Um, which means the entire craft is like a hybridization ship, which is focused purely on hybrid, the hybrid program. And as it, this is as a child, I'm being brought into this room with other children, and they are being inserted with implants by the dozen. So they are being implanted by a, a, a mechanical arm, and they are being piled up. Um, literally, uh, on one side. In another room, there are the pregnant hybrid mothers that are uh, giving birth, in a sense. And what I mean by giving birth is the longest gestation time that the majority of these mothers have is about three months maximum. They don't need the child to gestate longer than that. Um, I haven't heard of any anyone longer than that. But they remove the fetus. And Same they- thing with you. This This was your yes. experience. That was my experience. That was the longest time that I've had, um, you know, the gestation process. I was pregnant for that long amount of time. And in the film, you will see, you will see those experiences very clearly as well. But what they do is they remove the fetus and they put them into these incubation tanks, which are these spherical tanks. And I saw walls, walls of this. Okay. I mean, tanks after tanks, after tanks, after tanks. Um, So we're talking about something that's happening on on a massive scale here. The entire craft was dedicated to genetic modification. On the lower level, they were modifying uh, the genes. They were inserting, extracting information. You know, this is technology that's beyond us, but it's not so far away, Jimmy, because we are, our science is catching up. I mean, in China, um, a couple of months ago, uh, we had a scientist give birth to two high, uh, children that were genetically modified. You know, they, they, they were able to remove the strain that makes them uh, able to get, uh, via, uh, what is it called, um, AIDS, you know, right, right, uh, HIV, right, HIV. Right. So, so, you know, so these modifications are not something that's far off. And if you look in, in our media, it's coming up, it's coming up, you know, the, these, these programs that are being run since the, since the 40s, genetic, the government has been testing genetic modification, and hybridization as well, they're combining things, a lot of these papers are not published, some of them are published, but since no one is looking for them, they're not there. This is something that I'm putting in my book as well, because I, I want you all to to understand that this is something that has that's really actually happening here well the question um, the question we have and and geraldine i don't yeah. care what you're doing tomorrow but we're going to go into overtime here in 15 minutes so i'm not going to let you go so <laughs> okay. just plan on that um <laughs> it, the question that we all have here is why there's <laughs> multiple programs and lots of testimony about this but the question is why, ultimately, why do this? Mm-hmm. So it, it's a wonderful question that opens up our mind to a whole new level here. And the invitation is to understand and to take for a moment to consider uh, what it means to be multidimensional. Um, the human soul is a very interesting and fascinating uh, piece of information. When a human soul is entering into the physical, that uh, okay, so we come from the concept that that your human soul is almost like a recorder. It's, it functions just the way the DNA does. It stores information, but it also adapts and modifies as needed. When I talk about a multidimensional reality, I'm talking about uh, consciousness, okay? And um, let's say the origin of this consciousness is infinite consciousness. 
when it enters different dimensions, it'll change its form, it'll have different ways of reacting to its environment. When the consciousness enters the human body, two things happen. That consciousness is so is what we can understand as a soul is brought into the body. And the human body is attaching to the physical, which is, of course, where we have our blood run, running through our veins and our muscles and the DNA, basically, the algorithm that makes up this human body body and that information is linking you to your lineage a lineage of information so that means you are a product of your father your mother and all of your ancestors before that going to the origin of life on this planet Mm -hmm. all of that information is stored within your dna so what that means is that um, not only do we have that genetic information, but we have programs, we have a lot of uh, alterations, genetic modifications that we are now a product of. So that's what we are as human. Our human self is brought into these families, into these experiences that we have. Every experience is an opportunity to store the information from that experience. So in our lifetimes we're living, um, you know, we can feel pain, suffering, all those things and, and all these things that we are considering evolution in a way. But what we need to understand is that what we're living in is a very uh, – we are living in a compartmentalized reality, which is also – manufactured. Our reality, in a sense, is um, created uh, where everything is compartmentalized, our society, our concept of ourselves, the concept of sex, the concept of man, woman, the role that it plays, everything has been set up in a specific way for humans to develop their, themselves, their consciousness from this, this certain belief system. And we have the the reason why I bring it to that level is because in my personal journey I've questioned deeper and deeper trying to find an understanding of this. And when you do that, you start to question why the human race undergoes certain patterns of behavior in our history, suffering, death. Um, you know, all of what we're experiencing here is controlled in a sense. Okay. Um you know, we we are looking at our brothers and sisters that are experiencing a lot of suffering and we're constant survival mode. We're barely making paying our rent. And, there, you know, you go to Africa, we have all this horrible hunger, you know, we have all this these diseases going on. So the more and more you start to question reality, you understand that there is something that is operating on the back end to create these situations, to create these issues in our reality. And that's where we really need to start getting educated in. Not only are the main companies, these family lines that have created these companies that are running our reality, but everything is curated. We are like puppets because the human body is like a sponge. Everything that we're experiencing, that we're seeing, and of course we're being fed um, TV, television, movies and shows, uh, music, we have our work, we have our society, we have our families, we have a lot of stress. All of these things are a product of a very structured and organized reality. So all of that causes us to feel that we have to be focused on uh, uh, you know, survival. Um, that's, that's an issue. And my question is, if we are infinite consciousness, why are we put into this box of experience? And what, what I have, um, understood is that this human experience is one of many. Um, the hybridization program is taking fragments of this human body to create other races that are then also experiencing the same thing but what do they get out of this is that what they're doing with our dna with our human genome correct correct and the reason why i went through the whole uh, explanation of the soul is because what happens to the human when it is heavily under stress when it is always in survival mode when it is always questioning its own reality there is a fragmentation that occurs and this kind of fragmentation is what we can consider, for example, in my lab experiences in other um, government programs that have been utilizing mind control uh, to carry out certain programs or whatever. What do they do? They create alters in them through trauma and stress. They have these programs where we have sexual abuse They, you know, for, with children, with adults, that they heavily break down the human. Uh, to a level where they are fragmented severely. Not only do they have alternate personalities that can be manipulated and and um, 
managed. Um, but this and, and they do this so that this person can now be a tool, an asset for whatever program they're trying to carry out. In that same sense, as a human race, we are also kind of undergoing this kind of a fragmentation. But the fragmentation doesn't only happen on a physical level, it happens on a multidimensional level. Fragments of ourselves are in other dimensional timelines. Fragments of ourselves are these ET aspects of ourselves, which through the genetic modification, through the hybridization program, um, you know, we are connected. So this child that I met on the ship, I'm recognizing, I'm feeling, they are connected to me, not just genetically, but energetically, okay? And so when I experience something, that aspect of myself is linked to me. So how better to control consciousness than by breaking it down into many little pieces, which can be controlled individually, Okay. And, and so ultimately, that is answering the why question then. This is about control. This isn't a benevolent program. Well, the, the, well, that, that's a good question. It's also a complex question because in this reality, and, and the way I want you to look at this is from the concept of consciousness. Ultimately, we are living in a controlled environment, but only to the level of which that consciousness is not aware of what it's experiencing. And that's the problem. We as infinite consciousness, is uh, our job is to become aware of ourselves. Consciousness experiences all things. It can be good experience, it can be a bad experience. What has happened in this current timeline that we're living in is Consciousness has become unaware of itself. And when consciousness does that, it becomes parasitic. It needs to feed off of other things. Okay, so what we're living in right now is a parasitic um, aspect of that consciousness. And us as humans, which are also individual consciousness, have the ability of becoming aware of ourselves. And when we do, we can we can either choose to continue experiencing that kind of parasitic in exchange, or we can choose to experience something else. And I'm talking about the lifespan of a human between life and death, between birth until death, let's say 100 years. They have all this time to become aware of themselves as consciousness, or they can just live a regular routine life, die, and start over again. And, the, you know, this is a very complex topic because how families are put together are by their vibrational frequency, by the information that their DNA is holding on to. So what this is, this is how I um, began doing DNA reprogramming, because when I understood this, uh, you can deprogram DNA, you can reprogram this, and I'm talking about from the physical level, right. biological level, deprogram these programs in order to no longer continue this cyclical pattern of which we are involved in here on this planet. Okay, but ultimately, all we're talking about is consciousness. And because if we get stuck on the concept of reptilians, greys, and these specific lineages that are managing this, what do we do? The human goes into this panic mode of com feeling completely helpless, not just from that perspective, but based on their technology, they by far we feel that they overpower us. Bingo. But what, what I'm here to do is to remind you as a human that the human body actually has one of the most advanced biotechnologies in this universe, in this creation. And when we learn how to destroy those programs, we can uh, become conscious and re remove ourselves from that quote-unquote matrix or this kind of a reality, this uh, holographic reality that we are sharing. Um, you know, Jimmy, consciousness is very complex. You know, we are actually, in a sense, sharing this kind of um, shared creation. All of us are projecting this reality. But in other words, we are being told how to project and why to project what we're doing. So that's a lack of tremendous consciousness that we have to become aware of. You know? How can, and uh, we're going to head towards a break right here, um, how can I understand, you know, changing DNA it happens all the time. That is a, a, a pure physical uh, situation. But how can we uh, come up against something that is so much more advanced than us and actually just say no and stop this? Is, is I mean, could you have stopped it? 
Yes, uh, absolutely. And I and I that's why I am grateful for the experiences that I've had, because they helped me as a, let's say as an investigator, as a researcher to understand how to transcend these kinds of experiences. All that we're talking about. And here's the bottom line. This is where we merge spirituality, consciousness with the uh, alien uh, extraterrestrial phenomena. If you go far deep into spirituality, you will be met with the alien phenomena because you're going to look at the history, the origins of life on this planet. If you go far into the alien phenomena and do all your research, you're going to be met with spirituality because sooner or later you're going to have the question of consciousness and multidimensional presence. And those are the things that we need to start educating ourselves in in order to understand how to how to move through this reality that we have been heavily miseducated on what we're actually experiencing here on earth. We are in a multidimensional reality. Our bodies are multidimensional, which means that we are experiencing things in the physical and also in other ways. Our senses are the our tools to help us understand how to communicate on, on other dimensions. I know this as an experiencer because of my experience and how they were able to disable my emotions, for example. They were able to manipulate what I was seeing. They were able to, um, you know, make me feel something, take away my feeling from feeling pain, suffering, all those things. Uh, Not just physical, but aftermath of the abduction experiences. So that allows us to understand that consciousness can be manipulated. Now, It's manipulated because we are not conscious of what's happening. If a human becomes aware of the function of his body and what he's capable of, he can change and transform any experience that he's going through. Anything, absolutely anything. And this is the thing that um, is important to let people know that if you feel powerless at any moment in your life, uh, you know, that powerless feeling creates fragmentation of the soul, of, of yourself as a whole. And that basically it, it makes you further and further into this matrix. You get entangled more and more into the illusion of what we're living in. I got to take reality, a, oh, let me jump in right there. I got to take a break. But I was going to say it's kind of like watching CNN and Fox News. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> what's going on. Our guest tonight, Geraldine Orozco. Uh, We're heading straight into overtime, so don't panic, everyone. The conversation is going to continue right after this short break. Stay with us. This is Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and KGRA, The Planet. Stay with us. All right, welcome back. Overtime on Fade to Black. Our guest tonight, Geraldine Orozco. Now, very, very intriguing and, and might I say, comprehensive conversation tonight, uh, Geraldine. And I want to actually go back to a couple of points uh, that you made earlier uh, that I, I want to understand uh, more of what's going on, where you described... Rows and rows and rows and rows of these these tanks and these tubes with, uh, uh, fe- I guess, fetus or, you know, embryos growing in them uh, on these ships. Where are those, are those going back into women on this planet to, to grow? Are, where, where are those going? Are those going on Earth or are they going somewhere else? That's such a great question. Um, you know, they do not go back into women here, these these specifics. Um, so as I was saying, there are different hybridization programs. And the one that is happening on Earth, um, these can be genetically modified from the craft and then inserted in the women sometimes, sometimes. Um, but other times, they uh, these hybrids are either kept on the craft or taken to other, I guess, dimensions to carry out whatever their agenda is. It really depends on the agenda that they're trying to carry out. Um, as I know that there are many different agendas. Some of my children that were coming from the Draconian, um, for example, they are not even human. They are like these interdimensional beings, which to us would probably look like monsters. You know, they wouldn't look like humans. 
um, but they hold our genetic material. They hold they hold our DNA, and they are placed in other realities, or they are carried out. Um, you know, there's many different things going on in our reality, Jimmy. And that's why I try to explain it from the highest perspective so you can kind of get an overview of how this information is being kind of moved around our, our current reality. The way that we want to look at things is from our physical planet, right? We want to see the child in front of us. Um, some of these children, they don't grow older than what they are. And that's for a reason. When children are... Um, are from the ages of birth until seven, they are, they, in a, in a sense, they are very pure energetically. They are very open. All their energy centers are fully open. They are very um, programmable. They can be shifted, changed, manipulated in any, any number of ways. So my belief is that they keep some of these children that actually don't age. They're not made to be life, lifelong beings are used for specific things. They can be terrible things or maybe good things, okay? It just depends on the agenda that they're carrying out. Other other of these children are put into the planet, like, for example, me and you, the, the babies that are being born right now. That's another genetic um, program that, depending on which program is being put in, these children are either higher consciousness, more evolved beings, and we're seeing that. We can look at Mary Rodwell's work, which I sure there's some question love. about it, right, <laughs> right, right. Exactly, and she studies this. She studies how these hybrids that are being put on the planet are, you know, absolutely different. They have act, act, they have these activated abilities to have uh, psychic abilities, all kinds of gifts. Um, even children that, that, that seem to be uh, part of the spectrum are actually, you know, hybrid children. So there's many things going on at once. And the takeaway is that it's from our genetic material. And depending on what is being created from there, some of these children that are coming down with high vibration um, end goals, which means, in other words, to raise consciousness, to come wake up people, to help them see what's happening, to open their eyes um, and get past the illusion of this material matrix that we live in. Um, you know, that's what they're there for. And they're there to help us as markers to understand that as humans, we're not just these human guinea pigs or reproductive systems or, you know, feeling constant feeding of certain organisms that are indeed feeding off our lower vibration expression. Well, what's uh, so what's so special about our DNA? Yeah, and it's precisely the fact that it is it it, it holds massive amounts of information, which means that it can be programmed. It's programmable. It can be shifted. It can be altered. That's what makes the human DNA so interesting. And it's not just human. I mean, we basically we're not we're not human. In other words, we are we are genetically modified race. We're just different races with with different genetic modifications for whatever end goal is required. And that consciousness will direct where th these programs will be led. Okay, they can be led to the expansion of other races on other planets, which indeed is, is real. You know, there are many, actually almost every planet is, is inhabited by other beings, other species. Well, speaking are, of, well, I, I don't want to yeah. run out of time tonight. And speaking yeah. on that directly, yes. uh, you've, you've, the four of your children that, that you do know, yes. do you ever wonder uh, where they are and what they're doing today? Do you miss them? I, I um, you know, I've gone through a certain emotional roller coaster with that, but um, I'm a kind of person that I, I like to be a realist and I like to be really real about what's happening here. And the more I understand that this is an exchange of consciousness that we're experiencing, I don't tend to have any illusions of connections necessarily to them that are emotional uh, because it doesn't make sense, Jimmy. Um, you know, we are being my material, my genetic material has been utilized to create many different organisms, not just those children. And the purpose is not that connection or with them. It is an awakening, a realization, an education of what we are as humans. And that's what's important. I mean, ultimately, uh, we are all one. We are not disconnected. We are one consciousness. So whether my consciousness here is Geraldine and the human body or that um, ET hybrid, which holds my genetic material, there is a reason for that consciousness to be there. And it is basically a fragment of myself.
So I'm not separate from that. We're not separate from any of us, each other. You know, we are all fragments of each other experiencing this consciousness. Um, and that's the way I choose to look at it because um, I believe that it's necessary for us to look at it that way so that we can understand as consciousness how to move through this evolution, through this human human experience, which is um it's multidimensional. It's in dream time. We are active. We are also experiencing things in death. We are experiencing things in our level of conscious awareness will define those experiences. So it's really important that we become aware of that now. Well, you mentioned uh, the Nephilim earlier, and I wanted to get back to your four other children that you haven't met. And hopefully we'll have time to get back to that. But you mentioned the Nephilim and this altering of DNA is uh, very similar to the way that Sitchin introduced us to the, uh, the Anunnaki and what went down 150,000, 200,000 years ago where the human race suddenly just appeared, Homo sapiens sapien. We just appeared on this planet. Is this the same program that you are referring to now, the same altering of the DNA? Yeah, well, you know, I haven't read Sitchin's work. And I, to be honest, Jimmy, I'll be honest, I haven't read anyone's work. And the reason why is because I'm trying to preserve my information, okay, for its purity and the way I, I received it. Why? Because it's a different record, a different perspective of looking at these things. When I was shown the Nephilim, and again, I didn't know who they were before I heard that name. Um, you know, I was shown these beings that have like these beaks, these dark, tall beings. And when I when I went to my computer to put together a presentation, I was asked to put together a presentation on this information. I started to do research on it. And what did I look up? I looked up um, these uh, Anunnaki beings, and I looked at how they are basically all around the world. They're found all around the world. And I came across Sitchin's work. And uh, what was in parallel in the information that I received was the different locations of the earth of which these beings were, you know, creating life and mod modifying um, genes. But something that I didn't see in his work, and I did see in my regression, uh, from the limited amount that I saw during that uh, research, um, was an understanding of how uh, you know, the the royal bloodlines or original bloodlines were modified through history. So uh, beginning in Mesopotamia and then going through Africa, going through, um, you know, the southern Europe to northern Europe to the U.S. and then evolving from there. So when we look at history, all around the world, we have the same movement of this genetic lineage. So there's definitely something to that. There's something to that that we need to pay attention. We have um, petroglyphs of the Anunnaki around the world, from the Sumer to the Assyrians to the Egyptians to the Ines people to the Mayans, the Gilgamesh. We have it in Persia, Greece, Bolivia, which is where I'm from. Uh, you know, the South Sea Islands, American Indians, and a lot of ancient lore, ancient tablets. Um, I mentioned the, the emerald tablets, the Sumerian cuneiform. They all have the same similar story. And in a time where we, we are taught that there was not technology for communication, mm -hmm. how is it that this information spread around the world like that? You know, um, what I understood is that the genetic modification happens uh, from the race that comes extraterrestrial um, and I go through this in my presentation you know from from this race that enters into the into the planet but the modification is done on a much larger scale it is actually done through the Sun uh, and the Sun is actually functioning like an antenna which uh, provides information to all other planets within a certain galaxy so if they want to genetically modify something, they're going to do it many different ways. One of those ways is by uh, changing the frequency that the sun is emitting to all living beings within a galaxy. Okay, and this is how um, is also related to programmable consciousness, and what we can relate, we can um, uh, the name for that is is goo. That's what's been made known. Um, 
the concept of goo, which is programmable consciousness, something it's technology, it's, it's some kind of biotechnology that's programmable, um, is basically the thread or, or the substance of which our reality is, is made from, in other words. And there's a whole structure to this. Okay. What, what, uh, where, where does free will fit into all of this then? That's yeah. that's the part where I'm getting a little bit foggy here. But mm-hmm. but uh I'm not so sure that free will is is also part of our reality. Now I'm I'm just talking about on a scientific uh mathematical physics math mm-hmm. situation here where everything is inevitable it's going to play out nature is going to do its thing you just think you have free will. Um but in in the way that you're describing it here, it sounds like free will is not part. Help me out. <laughs> yeah. So and and you're right. I mean, the way that we look at it from this perspective, we feel completely helpless, and that we are basically at the mercy of all of these things, not just our reality, but the the physics of this creation are limiting our ability to even move. Um, but. Uh, free will, and this is why I talked about consciousness and why I talked about the perspective of looking at these things, not to get tied up in the concept of reptilian races or, you know, these different kinds of races that we feel are negatively imposing on the humans here, taking genetic material without our permission. We need to understand there's another level to this, and that level is consciousness, As infinite consciousness, we are fractals of that consciousness experiencing this human life. And in this human dimension, we are uh, experiencing our, our, our life. But in a sense, we have agreements to how we're going to experience this. How do we make those agreements? We make those agreements based on the aggregate experience of our entire history of being human or participating in this consciousness. So from the origin of your of your existence, we talked about those de- lineages of your father and mother, all those historical lineages that we are sharing with what I call a network. That's your family. Your family are all the people that you share information with. We are cycling in those families through certain experiences through a certain pain and it's basically what that consciousness has chosen to experience through the embodiment of that ancestral lineage so it's going to pop up in your great great grandfather and the same the same dilemma the same blockage the same concept belief system is going to be popping up in your own mother or your own self and what that allows us to understand is that we're cycling through these kinds of patterns of behavior that what is lacking is the conscious awareness, the conscious evolution from those thought programs. We transform that and we now change the vibration of our entire organism as a human. We then have the ability to experience other forms of reality, other things. So when we finish our life here, this current timeline, we can move on to other aspects of our of our reality. I want you to uh, imagine for a moment that uh, there's a web. You are at the center of that web. And your consciousness is uh, wherever you are aware is what is experiencing at that moment okay so you're at the center you're aware of this present moment uh, listening to this radio show that's where your conscious awareness is Mm -hmm. however to this web there are other aspects of yourself that are conscious that can be conscious depending on your access to them so the more that we become conscious of the other fragments of ourself which are basically dispersed within multiple dimensions of our reality we have alien aspects of ourselves we have uh, animal aspects of ourselves we have many different parts of ourselves we are interrelated and connected with other beings as well which are sharing those experiences so the reason why i'm taking it to this level is because i want you to understand that as a human race we are connected with those extraterrestrials that are also experiencing we are heavily connected with them so ultimately where our free will comes in is where our consciousness is aware 
So if you become conscious on this level and on other levels, like for example, in dream time, you become conscious, you, you start to practice and train yourself with lucid dreaming, you now become aware of another dimension of reality in which you learn how to navigate, you learn to control, you learn how to become aware of your physical body or your, your non-physical body, and you can navigate those planes. So because in these planes, this is where this contact occurs. It occurs in other dimensions of reality. We're talking about interdimensional beings here. We want to give them the name of extraterrestrials because our concept of reality is just the physical earth and then space as it was shown to us. But in reality, we are moving in and out of dimensions all the time. So we have to learn how to navigate these physical planes, these uh, dimensions of reality, physical and non-physical planes, pardon me, um, these dimensions of reality. So free will comes in when we become aware, when we become conscious beings that are aware of how they are navigating those spaces. And from there, you can decide whether you wish to participate in those things, whether it serves you to do so or not. And that's how somebody can decide not to participate in the hybridization program. The more that you work on becoming conscious and aware, you can demand and start to um, manipulate your experience by defining whether you wish to, you know, be taken, for example. Um, I'll give you an, an example. Um, even though their technology is very powerful, if you say that you do not want to be a part of it, they will not touch you. You can opt out. You can opt out. You can opt, you can out. opt out. And 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 the the bloodlines uh, that you have referred to, which I believe are absolutely one hundred percent real, mm -hmm. uh, are they aware? Consciously, I mean, I, I, I actually aware of of not only this entire program, but the connection to off planet. And uh, the second half of that question, I'll so we can get it both in before the end of the show. The government is our government uh, in in cahoots. Do they have agreements uh, with these off planet races for this program? Yeah, so I was talking about how the original origin uh, lineages have now uh, been developed into main blood families, bloodline right, right, families right. that are basically running our reality right now. They own 147 companies, people own our world. They run the show. They decide how we are living our lives. Okay, and um, that being said, these bloodlines um, are defining, uh, you know, how we spend our money, how we do things, how how we, what we're eating, the the pharmaceuticals that we're ingesting into our body, um, and so the answer is is yes, they are they are aware that they are a part of these program family lines, but. You need to look at it from the concept of consciousness and how conscious works again. As I mentioned earlier, when consciousness rejects itself, it becomes parasitic. So this conscious person, this being, this essence of consciousness has decided, I no longer want to be conscious and aware. So now I will go into, and when consciousness doesn't become aware, we go into the lower levels of our, of our, of our body, into the lower levels of existence. Our vibrational frequency now becomes parasitic, meaning that we require from others to survive. Right. That means that now we're doing, uh, you know, terrible things to take from other people. So this is what it is. So this this uh, this governing organism that has taken over our reality has become parasitic to take from those beings that are incarnating in this planet to experience life, um, to feed off of them. You know, that's why they talk about these archons and these beings that are feeding off of us. That is extremely real. And it's so real that, you know, it's it's worse than a, than a horror movie, really, because the technology that is being put into our reality, the things that are being manipulated are meant to keep you as a human in a state of survival, in a state of suffering, pain, the belief that you are helpless, that you are incapable. And that is a lie, a complete 
um, untruth of what we are as humans. So when consciousness becomes aware of itself, it can then choose not to experience those things. And it has the ability to discern what is real and what is not. So that's where we need to educate ourselves. So, um, and when we are, uh, you know, not conscious, we are um, thinking that what we're doing is, is okay. It's okay to be parasitic. It's okay to take from others. So we have to check ourselves. Just like these family lineages have chosen that state of consciousness. It doesn't mean that it makes it wrong, Jimmy. Because in this reality, we have duality. And in this dimension, um, it's based on the law of three. We have the father, the mother, and the son. We have positive, negative, and the product of that of that combination of energy, which creates life. Okay, that's the basic law of creation in this reality. So in that same way, we require both dualistic uh, existences to create, to create everything. So we need both of those. And as a matter of fact, in order for a human to become conscious, they need to be able to integrate both dualistic aspects of themselves. They need to be aware of both sides, accept them, understand them, learn them, educate themselves on what they are so that they can then become whole and complete. That's just the right natural physics of nature of everything in this reality. It's a delicate balance between, um, you know, good and bad, between positive and negative energy. So that's the kind of perspective we need to have when we think about these things. The government is very much doing these things to destruct, to heavily invert what is pure, what is divine, what is right in this reality. And we have to have the consciousness to be able to be aware and discern what is true from what they're telling us and what we're watching and pull away from that. You know, we need to come into uh, a state of purification, of cleansing, of consciousness to begin to become uh, uh, basically uh, free will. You know, we need to take our free will and understand what it means. There's a responsibility to that. What an amazing conversation tonight, Geraldine. I want to thank you for this. Where can everybody uh, reach out to you? What's the easiest way to do that? Thanks so much. If you would like to get a DNA reprogramming with me, you can visit GeraldineOrosco.com. If you are an experiencer, a hybrid mother, a father that is experiencing, you can visit HybridMother.com. And I am very happy to serve in any way I can and uh, answer your questions. Thank you so much for having me on, Jimmy. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Geraldine. Be safe out there, and I look forward to our next conversation. Thank you so much. Geraldine Orozco. The links for Geraldine are over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Day one of our amazing Women Week here on Fade to Black. I want to remind everybody that tomorrow night, Hanovi Strong Deer is going to be here. Another first-time guest. You're not going to want to miss tomorrow night's show. Wednesday night, it's Kathleen Martin. And I can't wait for our conversation with Kathleen. And then Thursday night, Dr. Lynn Katai. And uh, and, and speaking with Geraldine right now, this is one of the amazing parts of all of this, talking about DNA. And when we, we go back, think about the amazing conversation that we just had tonight, right? How does a particle combine with another particle that doesn't have a brain, right? Blood. (laughs) How do particles combine at the atomic level to the point where her and I are having a conversation that you are listening to and we are discussing consciousness? How is that possible? Science doesn't understand how this happens because uh, a cell phone is made out of those same particles. This pen is made out of those same particles. What's the difference that makes us who we are? Fascinating conversation tonight. Thank you so much, Geraldine. I am your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Network and KGRA, The Planet. Fade to Black's executive producer is Rita Kamarian. Show is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee, Dennis, and Bob. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vitoa, Mark D. Kovar. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Thank you so much, Drew. Amazing work. Music is Doug Aldrich. Intro, Spaceboy. Spaceboymusic.com. Faded Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network. And syndication is KGRA, The Planet. 
This broadcast owned and copyrighted 2019 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Until tomorrow night with Hanovi Strong Beer. I want everybody to be safe. Go back, Lee Tapping.